back to left again, okay, heat is going to be released when gases, in case water vapor goes to a liquid, or when a liquid goes to a solid, heat is also released. That's latent heat. Okay. So the first paragraph is kind of going from left to right. Okay, heat is, is required or absorbed. Okay, the second little paragraph is going from right back to left again. Heat is released. Now, it's pretty, to me, intuitive thinking of the whole ice cube thing, you know, you add heat to melt it. But it's not as intuitive thinking like as a liquid goes to a solid, energy is released. But you've got to kind of start to get into that idea. And that's latent heat. So like I said, I don't have a figure this semester apparently that says like in a good unit of heat would be joules or kilojoules. You've probably heard of that before, joules. Um, you can do like joules per gram of water, you know. Um, so um, here's a figure from your textbook, and it's actually set up exactly like I did it a little bit ago. Make sure that's not a coincidence. Um, so here's where you have a solid going to a liquid. You guys said you need to add heat, okay? Um, and then a liquid going to a gas, okay, you need to add heat. Now notice, of course, you guys are familiar with the terms melting, okay, and evaporation. Yep. If we go down on the other side, kind of going from right back to left, remember that heat is actually going to be released, okay? Heat is released as um, vapor condenses. Heat is released as liquid solidifies. And I like it because they did more justice to, for instance, um, that is solid. That's ice. That's solid water. And they did a good job showing you the connections between the water molecules. Okay. And over here, there's no bonds. And here, when I talk about bonds, I mean kind of connections between the water molecules. And here, there is um, lots of bonds. And in between, a moderate amount of bonds. Like as a liquid, there are some bonds, but some bonds have been broken. Cool. No pun intended. Okay. So actually, latent heat, the whole melting ice and taking water and vaporizing it, that actually is a way to transfer energy when we, when we do those things. These are other ways to transfer energy. It might be more clear to actually see. So anything that's not latent heat is called sensible heating. Okay, so these are ways where actually you can almost see the heat relocate. Okay, um, so convection is a way that, that warm things or heat relocates. So convection is shown in the simple case with... Um, I'm just, this looks really weird. You don't go camping, right? And you don't take a pan from your kitchen and go camping because it's still like campfire meat and hold it over. Your hand's going to get hot. You probably would have something to set it off, but that's okay. That's how we, the figure we had to deal with. And he's got water in his pan. Notice the bottom of the pan is getting hot because it's kind of showing the red color. The top of the pan is still cooler because it's away from the flame. So one of the things we know about anything any fluid like liquid that you get hot, it actually, um, if you get it hot, it expands and it becomes buoyant, it becomes lighter than its surroundings. So actually, warm water will rise just like in your hair, in your air, in your house, warm air will rise, warm water will rise. And that relocating of the warm water is called convection. Okay, it happens, happens in the interior of the earth. I mean, convection is kind of a, it happens with a lava lamp. If you buy a lava lamp, okay, <laughs> which I finally did because I always wanted one, but they were so expensive. I don't know why lava lamps were so expensive. But I finally bought one the other day, or, and I think it's still in the box. But the way lava lamps are basically, they have a heating element that warms the fluid, and as it warms, it expands, and it gets buoyant. It gets less dense, and it rises. Okay, so convection. Conduction is another way to relocate heat. Um, conduction is shown in the handle. The idiot, I'm sorry, the guy or the person who's holding the, 
<laughs> you know, it's like, what? Okay, so right here, the way conduction works, I say, is from molecule to molecule to molecule. It's, conduction is kind of like if you play telephone and you tell somebody a message and they pass the message down. The problem with that game is usually by the time it gets down to the end, they had no idea what you said. Okay, but with conduction, it works pretty good. So it conducts up the handle. Hopefully it was a plastic handle, and with regard to thermal energy, plastic is pretty slow to, condu to conduct it. Aluminum handle. So those are kind of in players in weather. Those are definitely players in weather. Um, oh, actually, conduction is, that's right, what the slide says, and sometimes it's a homework, homework question. Conduction is less, much less of a player in, in weather than convection. Conduction, the molecule to molecule to molecule, not so much. Large blobs of air, yes. And actually the last one is important in, um, in weather or the, our atmosphere or Earth system. Radiation, we're going to spend a fair bit of time talking about. I had a poster. I had a radiation poster. I forgot to bring it. But if you ever heard about the sun's radiation, okay, the sun gives us all forms of what we call electromagnetic radiation. So radiation shown here is basically this thermal energy oozing up from your fire. Okay, just oozing. Um, I'm going to, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Well, I'll go ahead and add something to the radiation. Actually, that type of, we're going to talk about different, different family members of radiation. This is probably, you've probably heard of infrared. That's probably the cousin or the family of energy, I would say, the type of radiation that's coming from that, from that flame, infrared radiation. So these are the three, those are three um, sensible, um, sensible heating ways to, to move heat from one location to another. And again, this one is least important in weather. Okay, so convection, that was the blob heating up, expanding, and rising. So within our atmosphere, there's this phenomenon called creating thermals and um, creating rising thermals. Um, eagles, I know, sometimes will catch these rising chunks of air. And why does this chunk of air rise? Well, because it's warmer than its surroundings. How did it get warmer? Well, and actually we're going to talk about this, but if you've ever worn a black shirt out on a sunny day, does your black shirt get really hot? What if you were in a crowd of people wearing white shirts? You'd be hot and they would be cool. <laughs> They'd be cool. You'd be hot. You'd both be great. Um, so um, you would actually then kind of create a nice warm spot. And if you had air, if you sat there long enough, you could create your own thermal. <laughs> You could actually uh, warm, as you got hot, you could warm the air right above you. And as the, war, as the air right above you got warm, it would expand and be more, or excuse me, it'd be less dense, more buoyant than the air. So it would rise. You could create your own thermal. Sounds like an experiment. Now, thermals or rising air is important because we're, because, um, because of this idea of creating clouds. Basically, what we're going to talk about is that as a chunk of air rises, um, it can be warm or cool, but as it rises, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Do you remember we talked about that weather balloon? It gets the size of a house. Okay. So chunks of air that are rising will cool just because they're, what we say, expanding, just because they're getting bigger, and that's actually work. And it's, they cool down because they're working. So a cooling chunk of air, one of the things about a cooling chunk of air is it has the potential to form a cloud. That's my point. So um, cloud growth is, can often come from um, this activity in the, in the atmosphere. So that third type of sensible heating called radiation, we've got to dive into that a little bit. Okay, so radiation. These are just kind of some characteristics of radiation. Now, I already told you infrared radiation was a type of radiation, okay? Um, visible light is a type of radiation, 
Actually, there they all are. One of the things, and I have a figure from your textbook that I probably would do, um, remember for your unit exams you can have a note card? I probably on my note card somewhere would put these different forms of radiation. Um, let's see. I don't have them all listed, do I? I have x-rays, visible light, radio waves. That's only three. I think I have four more. But those are all just kind of cousins or different kind of flavors of, ra of electromagnetic radiation. Um, all of these energies travel at the speed of light. What's the variable for the speed of light? Do I know? Here's your hint. E is equal to m blank squared. Speed. Yep. <laughs> the variable for the speed of light is C. Yep. So they all travel really fast. Okay. They can all travel in a vacuum, which actually the other two forms of sensible heating we talked about, convection and conduction, they don't happen in a vacuum. Radiation happens in a vacuum, vacuum space. That, you know, it can't have the vacuum. So when I talk about these different types of energies, these different, and I kind of call them cousins of energy, visible light, um, what did I say, uh, infrared, you know, ultraviolet, x-rays, they're all related by that list you had a minute ago, but they differ by what we call their wavelength, okay? So um, literally, you can they have this kind of repeating unit thing going on, kind of an up and down. We call it a crest in a trough, a crest in a trough, okay? And um, the distance between a repeating unit is called the wave, a wavelength. So I'll put, let's see, I'll put, the, this would be a crest, okay? And this right here would be a trough, okay? So crest, trough, okay? And actually, that distance right there is from kind of the middle of a crest to and trough to the middle of a crest and trough. That is one complete wavelength right there. So what I have here is another wavelength. So this is called A and this is called B right here. And now if these are drawn to scale. Okay, can you see where this wavelength is shorter and this wavelength is longer? By the way, the symbol for wavelength, it kind of looks like a kind of a, like a carrot with a little soup on it. Okay, so it's the Greek letter lambda. So here's the deal. Do I say it right here? Yeah. So this says the shorter the wavelength, the more energetic the radiation. The longer the wavelength, the lower, the less energetic the radiation. And you're going to recognize when you see these cousins what seems like more energetic and what's less. So this, when I said put it on your note card, this is probably one of the, you know, probably several things you're going to want to put on your note card. So these are all different forms of electromagnetic radiation, and you've heard of them all, gamma rays, x-rays. So gamma rays actually are the most dangerous. These are the shortest, shortest wavelength. And these are, they're the most energetic. I'll put most E for energetic. Um, then we have ultraviolet. I'll put a UV for ultraviolet. Okay, actually we already ran into ultraviolet, didn't we, when we talked about ozone. We said that we're going to see that the sun sends us all of these energies and the ultraviolet radiation from the sun actually is helped block by the ozone in the stratosphere, right? And then after ozone, we have visible light. And since visible light is so important, kind of we took that sliver of wavelength energies and kind of split it out. But um, these colors, um, actually this purple color over here, otherwise known as violet, I suppose, this is the shortest wavelength shortest lambda, and over here, this is the longest wavelength, lambda. I'm going to give you a mnemonic device coming up that if you take the colors of 
that looks, does look like a rainbow. Colors of the rainbow. The longest, if you take, spell out the name, like a person's name, Roy, R-O-Y, and his middle initial B, or Roy G, Biv, B, oops, goodness, B, I, V, I don't know, the I stands for actually the color, indigo. I'm not real familiar with indigo, so. But Roy G. Biv, going backwards, is from longest wavelength to shortest wavelength. Can come in handy. All right, oh, actually, that's what's right here. But you have to kind of think of backwards. All right, very good. Okay, so when I say laws of radiation, I'm talking about, when I say radiation or electromagnetic radiation, it's the same thing. Radiation, electromagnetic radiation, it's the same thing. I'm talking about all those cousins of energy, energies. So they have this in common. Um, we're actually, well, how do I say this? All objects, they kind of have their own little fingerprint as to kind of the radiations they're oozing. Us in here, we're oozing different energies. Okay, one of the things we know we're oozing is heat, and I told you heat and infrared radiation are the same thing, heat and infrared radiation. Um, so all objects ooze their own kind of fingerprint of radiation. Now, the hotter the object, um, the more radiation it emits. That kind of makes sense. The hotter the, okay, the more radiation. I'm going to show you these radiation curves here in a minute. And along, kind of along what we say the y-axis is the amount. So basically, if you have something that's very hot, it's going to have a lot of radiation. Something that's cooler, it's full of radiation. The curve's going to be smaller. The other important law of radiation is this, that if it's hot, not only does it emit more radiation, but it's more skewed towards the shorter wavelengths, which kind of makes sense, too, because the shorter wavelengths are the more energetic energies. So as you wrote them, gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, visible, and then infrared, okay, um, uh, did you have microwaves, radio waves, okay? So not only, and then let's look at the other way. Something that's cooler, will, the curve will be squatty, and it will be over here to the longer wavelengths, okay? Um, and here's another one. This is the last one. Um, something that is good at absorbing radiation is also good at re-emitting it. Okay, and I'll, the Earth actually is a good, um, a good example of that. So this, this red curve right here actually is the curve of energies that's coming from the sun. Okay, pointed in all directions, including the Earth. And we'll kind of, kind of talk about how the Earth, what the Earth does with the energy it cuts from the sun. But you see over there, uh, actually along the x-axis, is different energies, okay? Notice that it kind of doesn't show all of them, but you're just going to, we're just going to have to kind of uh, take it that there is also, let's see, bef shorter than ultraviolet is x-rays, shorter than x-rays is gamma rays, okay? Um... All right. So the deal is, it's kind of cool. I love, the one of the things I love about physical science in this universe is there are some very constant things. And one of the things is something that is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the surface temperature of our sun, not the core temperature of our sun, will have a fingerprint kind of like this with regard to radiation it sends out. It's like it's... It's a fingerprint, and actually we can use that with other stars. We can use the fingerprint of other stars to get a fix on what the surface temperature of other stars are. But I like what your author's done because we can compare that to the Earth. Okay. So the blue curve is the Earth. And notice actually there's this little important, um, and I didn't pay attention to it just now, but you, if, you, if you've done much looking at graphs, you know what that little break means. It means that 
they really didn't fit very good on the same graph, so they kind of, kind of chopped off the dead part. Okay. So notice, though, that the curve for the Earth follows those radiation curves. Um, the Earth's surface temperature right now is about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. It's weird to think of what, you know, grab the Earth and say, okay, what's the temperature, Earth? Okay, it's about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's cooler than the sun, so it's the longer wavelengths and the squattier. So that works. So just our portion of the sheet of information, uh, excuse, excuse me, the sheet of energy that the sun is sending us, what do we do with it? Well, it depends upon, like this says, it depends upon which energy it is because our Earth's atmosphere definitely handles light from the sun differently than it handles, for instance, x-rays from the sun. We're going to see here in a minute that x-rays from the sun actually are basically blocked out, which is kind of nice. Um, not all planets have atmospheres, so we have one that works really well for us. So it depends on what wavelength it is, and it also depends upon what little particle in the atmosphere it interacts with. Because remember we talked about the Earth's atmosphere? We have an assortment of gases. The Earth's atmosphere has an assortment of particulates and, you know, and liquids and solids, especially near the Earth's surface. Um, I guess that's it. But one of three, one of three slash four things can happen. When that particular energy interacts with that particular particle in the atmosphere, there's a possibility that based upon those two criteria, the energy just comes right on through. It kind of basically is unhindered. Okay. Um, it's possible, these other two things are possible too. It's possible that when there's an interaction with that particular energy from the sun and that particular particle, that... Um, the, the energy can be absorbed by the particle. And in general, what will happen is the particle will get warmer. And then it's possible that there's the interaction and the particle says, um, no, um, I recognize you and I am going to redirect you. Either I'm going to basically, like a mirror, I'm going to redirect you back that way where you came from, or I'm going to kind of scatter you in one direction or just kind of randomly scatter you. So, of course, the yellow is the radiation coming from the sun, all different energies coming from the sun. And um, we're going to look at a few kind of balance figures. So this is our first. Okay, if you figure like uh, 100 units coming from the sun, um, now, to me, I'm going to put a question mark next to the clouds because you're like, dude, sometimes it's cloudy, sometimes it's clear. How do you go with that? So your authors just kind of picked what is kind of an average, maybe, cloud coverage. Not partly cloudy, I guess you'd call it. So in this scenario, 50% makes it um, of the energy makes it to the Earth's surface. 20% um, is um, absorbed by the clouds. And then, um, let's see, where the other, oh yeah. I looked at this at... That's 70%. 30% lost to space. That would be this, this, and this. What am I missing, guys? 20%. Twenty percent absorbed by the clouds. Yeah, but twenty percent. Okay. Oh, okay. So I'll change my color. So you guys are saying fifty here. 20 here, and then this would be another set. This is the 20 that's scattered back, and then so I'm up to 90, and then here's the other 10.
I buy that 10, but or that 5, but I don't necessarily buy that 5. Because that 5 looks like it's coming from the cloud. So, okay, I agree. I see what you're saying, though. Just kind of in general. Particularly, a particular amount of cloud cover. Okay, so we're actually going to see a few another figure, um, which we can kind of ponder here in a minute with regard to energy coming from the sun. But another way to look at energy coming from the sun is with regard to um, how much energy will be absorbed versus how much energy will be scattered back. Um, and I kind of think as land objects. The absorptivity of objects is generally how much... Um, how willingly something will absorb energy. So, um, not the Earth's surface, I guess. When it comes to ozone, what's the formula for ozone, you guys? O3. O3, exactly. Remember, we talked about good ozone and bad ozone. So in this case, we're talking about good ozone in the stratosphere. Okay. So with regard to good ozone, one of the things it does is selectively... Um, interact with incoming um, ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Another thing in the atmosphere, um, we said that water is a variable gas in the atmosphere. The presence of water actually interacts with incoming infrared radiation. I know this says NIR, not just IR, but NIR is a type of infrared radiation. Okay. So water vapor can actually interact and kind of scatter infrared radiation away, kind of taking sometimes, like this slide says, you know how high, humid, high humidity days make us feel bad? We feel extra hot when it's muggy outside. But another thing about the high humidity days is that the water vapor actually can absorb some of the sting of the sun, sun's piercing energy. So... Dry days, even though there were, we feel more comfortable, the sun's intensity can, can be even worse. All right. So this whole idea of scattering, we have direct reflection, and then we have kind of more like a random scattering. Um, so reflection means, and actually there's, there's an angle of incidence and an angle of reflection that is like normal to the um, are perpendicular to the normal surface. But anyway, if it reflects, you know where it's going to go. If it scatters, you don't. There's a couple of different versions of scattering. Um, just regular scattering means that, um, let's see, regular scattering means that it changes direction and, and loses some intensity. Um, Back scattering. is when, I have in my notes, backscattering is when the energy is um, scattered both forward and reverse. I don't know. But they're both random. So, um, okay. So now this is onto the Earth's surface. That wasn't the Earth's surface. Um, albedo is basically, albedo and reflectivity go together. If you guys notice, you can't help but notice on a snow-covered day like this, um, where you almost want to, immediately, if the sun's shining, you want to grab your sunglasses, right? Yeah. It's because the snow is very reflective, and that's exactly what we're talking about here. Um, a high albedo means high reflectivity. They differ only by kind of where the decimal point is. So, for instance, if something is 100% reflective, then it is what we call 1.0, that's its albedo. If it's 50% reflective, its albedo is 0.5, okay? 25% reflective, then its albedo would be, what do you think? 0 0.25. 0 0.25, exactly. So we've got some surfaces here, and it's not so surprising that the dark things, like the wet plowed field, now that would be percent reflectivity. So its reflectivity is pretty low. Okay, um, yeah, and so that means its albedo is low, 
I'm thinking the absorptivity and albedo, they're opposite. Um, so um, low albedo, low reflectivity. Um, let's pick something that has high reflectivity. Oh, the clouds. Okay, so up here we have those nice fluffy white clouds that are highly reflective. Um, and they have a high albedo. Notice though that actually what the reflectivity or albedo of an object depends not only on its color, like the dark cloud, um, something that's dark has a low reflectivity, um, or something that's light white has a high reflectivity, but also kind of the nature of it. Um, a good example is water down here. Is this not bizarre or what? You can get a terrible sunburn if you're out fishing, right, or something like that. You know, water is very reflective. Um, but uh, depending on the angle of the sun, it can be not very reflective at all, which I think is kind of weird. Okay. But if, you know, we talked about having um, a region that can get kind of especially warm, and so the air above that surface warms, and so it kind of expands and rises convection. And so this is kind of how we can definitely get some convection going. So you may already know this, but with regard to um, the color you see something, something as. So when we turn on the lights in here, basically we have um, white lights are sending all colors of, of light. So they're sending Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. So, but if we look at something, I think I, I picked, let's see, for example, a blue. If we look at something blue, okay, um, this lanyard, um, the deal is, is that blue is being reflected, but everything else is being absorbed, okay? So that's why I said if you take Roy G. Biv, okay, and the Roy G. and Iv are absorbed, Okay, the blue is reflected, basically. That's why we see, perceive a color like it is. Um, so taken further, okay, um, something white is basically all colors of the rainbow. So the little Elmo here that says Elmo on this blue lanyard is white. So that means that Roy G. Biv is reflected there. And if it's a nice sunny day outside and it's hot and you don't want to get any hotter, you will wear something white because you want as much reflectivity as you can. Okay? So high albedo. Okay. So light coming from the sun, there's direct light from the sun and then there's diffuse light from the sun. Um, direct light basically comes directly from the sun and it doesn't take any excursions. Um, diffused light is light that has come from the sun and kind of bounced around a little bit. Um, so, let's see. If we were going to make that, let's see, would this work? Maybe. If we were going to make that projector the sun, make that projector the sun, and it's noon, I don't know how this is all working, but the sun's up there. And so if the sun's up there, my shadow would be cast right underneath there, right? Right here. My sun, my shadow's right there. Okay. But now if I were to go ahead and drop an object underneath that stool, by golly, um, can you get that stool to the object? Not as easily. It wouldn't be as lit up as much. It would be like in the kind of the shadow areas. I agree. But would you see it? I mean, if you looked down this way, would it be totally pitch dark? It would depend on the light being reflected into it, <laughs> I guess. I think so, yeah. Yeah. So to me, you know, if I put another way, if I put it out here, and there's the noon shadow, or it's not the noon shadow, there's the noon sun, okay? I am totally going to see that with direct light, okay? But if I put it here, in the shadow of the stool, under the stool, um, I'm going to see the shadow kind of circle, okay? Um, but I'm still going to see the pen. 
And the reason you see anything where it's shadow is basically because of diffused light. It's not direct light, but it's basically light from the sun that is kind of subtly then redirected and it's diffused light. One of the things that I've been kind of fascinated with, maybe you have too, is like, now I know we landed on the moon, but some people say we didn't. I just don't know how to work. Mythbusters couldn't convince them. No one else can. But the thing about the moon is it has no atmosphere. And part of this cool phenomenon of having diffused light, like we have, or of course it has, has to do with Earth's atmosphere. So I'm like, so on the moon, you see things in the Probably not. So, unless it was a hoax, then. <laughs> but I haven't been able to kind of convince myself of, of it in that sense. Okay. Um, all right. So, blue skies and Raleigh scattering. Okay, we'll do this slide and then we'll take a break. Um, so the moon, like if you go to the moon sometime, um, the deal about that is even like at noon on the moon, um, I don't know how that works. But anyway, if the sun is like not below the horizon and you're on the moon, your skies will not be blue, they'll be like pitch black. Basically, you'll see the sun Okay, and you'll see the moon's horizon, and then will be basically black. Okay, it, it has no blue skies. And that's because it has no atmosphere to scatter the particles, excuse me, to scatter the energy, the blue colors. Okay, the thing about the Earth's atmosphere is it's nitrogen and oxygen, preferentially, um, what this figure's showing you, is if you start over here, this would be like when the sun is high in the sky. Basically what happens is that the sun sends um, all colors of the rainbow and the, um, the short wavelengths, which would be blue, indigo, and violet, are pinged out. They're scattered. Not entirely scattered, but some of them. Some of those, um, some of those energy of particles. And s s some of those energies. And so as they're pinged out, they basically kind of run up against other particles and kind of scatter, and, and so that's why the skies are blue. Then over here, um, showing you that the sun is low on the horizon. And you remember when we talked about beam depletion? That's exactly what we have going on here. The way the beam depletion is being shown is that when you have a high angle, which is when the sun is at noon, Right here, you have a high angle, maybe even 90 degree angle. Okay, the amount of atmosphere that is depleting the sun's energy and scattering the short wavelengths is less than here. So what happens when the sun's angle is low, I don't even know what angle you call that, very low, okay, um, is that there is more of the Earth's atmosphere that the sun's energy needs to go through. And you can have more scattering. So basically, I think they could have done a little better with just drawing, but basically here on the front end of energy coming from the sun, your blue, indigo, and violet is scattered, scattered more. At some point, basically, you run out of blue, indigo, and violet, and you just have red, orange, and yellow, and green coming through, because this is, this is scattered out early on. So one of the things is that if you are up um, either early in the day or late in the day when the sun is low on the horizon, sunrise or sunset, and you hold up a white piece of paper, basically the light from the sun is is it looks like somebody's shining a red flashlight on that white piece of paper. And this is why. Because of beam depletion. Specifically the short wavelengths. 
Okay, so yeah, let's take a break, um, another 10 minute break, but I think we'll probably just finish this up after break and call it a day, so I think we're doing pretty good. Because we did a lot of slides that time. <laughs> 